stories tonight and why news. Retired Supreme Court Senior Associate Justice urges the Philippine government to conduct civilian activities in the West Philippine Sea. Senate President Juan Miguel Migzibiri brushes aside rumors of his alleged ouster as he expressed gratitude towards his colleagues for their unwavering support and confidence in his leadership. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, or MMDA, confirms that enforcers from local government units in Metro Manila will continue to issue violation tickets to motorists found in breach of traffic laws. And we will find out why the International Criminal Quarter ICC issued arrest warrants to top Russian officials. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Wednesday, March 6, 2024. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the Philippines and in other parts of the world. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UN TV news and rescue social media channels. I am Harleen Delgado. First in the news. The National Task Force West Philippine Sea has labeled the actions of a Chinese Coast Guard vessel against a Philippine supply boat yesterday as the most severe incident in the ongoing maritime dispute in the West Philippine Sea. Based on the reports, four Philippine Navy personnel sustained minor injuries when the glass windows and windshield of the Philippine supply boat Oniza May 4 were shattered after being water cannoned by two Chinese Coast Guard vessels. Furthermore, one of the Chinese vessels executed a risky maneuver dangerously close to a Philippine Coast Guard vessel, resulting in minor damage. This incident comes on the heels of a previous incident last year when a Chinese ship targeted a military-grade laser at a Philippine Coast Guard vessel, resulting in temporary blindness for two PCG personnel. If the question is, uh, is this the more most serious, uh, yes, because now we have um, minor injuries um, uh, that has happened to our troops. A Philippine legal luminary urges the Philippine government to conduct more civilian activities in the West Philippine Sea. J.P. Nunez will tell us why. Retired Supreme Court Senior Associate Justice Antonio Carpio argued that China's harassment such as against the country's regular resupply mission in the West Philippine Sea can be suppressed by conducting more civilian activities. Carpio proposed to install a civilian lighthouse which will be operated by a civilian government agency or the Philippine Coast Guard or PCG. Additional PCG and Navy vessels will escort civilian resupply missions. Of course, China will block, but we anticipate that. Well, then we go now to the tribunal, and then we have another, another ruling against China. Papatungan ang papatungan natin ng ruling yan. And then we will get more support from the rest of the world because they, want, they don't want uh, their neighbor to copy China. If China impedes such activities, the Philippines can now ask the intervention from the international community because they have jurisdiction. We should have invite the entire world to conduct joint patrols with us or multilateral patrols with us in the West Philippine Sea. In fact, we should have joint patrols with our ASEAN neighbors. The Vietnamese, Malaysian, Indonesians will jointly patrol the West Philippine Sea. We will also jointly patrol their area, their EZ, so that every time we do that, we tell China that 9 dash line, 10 dash line has no effect on us. In addition, Carpio said the Philippines should invite its allies such as the United States to conduct joint or multilateral maritime exercises in the West Philippine Sea. Carpio emphasized China would not engage in war, especially with the U.S. This would put pressure on China that it has no right over the waters it claimed to be its own, notwithstanding the 2016 arbitral ruling in favor of the Philippines. Pag civilian vessel yon, 
Coast Guard pinadala natin to resupply the lighthouse, civilian lighthouse, blinak ng China, then we can complain pag may dangerous maneuvers because it's a civilian. We can go to Hong Kong to complain and get an order directing China to stop because may jurisdiction ng Hong Kong civilian na eh. JP Nunez, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The House Committee of the Whole adopts resolution of both houses number seven or the measure which aims to lift restrictive economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution. The measure was opposed by several minority lawmakers. Rosalie Cons will tell us why. After six days of deliberation by the House Committee of the Whole on resolution of both houses number no. 7, or RBH 7, the measure has been adopted. This is the House version of the measure to amend the restrictive economic provisions of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, particularly concerning public utilities, education, and advertising industry. The deliberation was terminated past 2.40 p.m. I move, Mr. Chairman, that we adopt committee report on House Bill number, on re resolution of both houses number seven. So move. There is a motion to adopt the committee report of the committee of the whole house on resolution of both houses number seven. The, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say nay. Aye. The ayes have it. The committee report of the committee of the whole regarding the resolution of both houses number seven is hereby adopted. However, Albay 1st District Representative Ed Selagman raised concerns over the measure. The Constitution is not a historical relic. Our Constitution is only 9, 39, 37 years old. To a human being, it is in its prime. A Constitution gives guidelines to the present and guide post to the future. That is why we should be cautious and consensus in amending our constitution. Several members of the minority bloc voted against it, stating that the content of RBH 7 as well as the proceedings regarding it are questionable. While introducing amendments to the economic provisions of the constitution might result to the country being conducive and welcoming to more foreign capital, it is not a guarantee that it would be the sole key to economic prosperity. Kaya kapag inaprobahan po ito, ang pangamba po natin dito, 100% ang foreign ownership talaga. Pagtitibayin at sasementohan lamang ng chacha ang mga patakarang neoliberal at tatanggalin ang mga restriction para ganap na makapag-ari at lalong mandambong ang mga dayuhan ang lupain ng lupain at ekonomiya ng bansa. Wala pong pakanabang dito. Panay peligro lamang ang dulot ng chacha dahil lalo nitong isasubo ang ating bansa sa mas matinding abuso, pagsasamantala at pandarambong. Hindi konstitusyon ang may kasalanan kung bakit ganito ang ating sitwasyon ngayon. Ang dahilan niyan ay yung mga polisiya na ipinatutupad natin sa ekonomiya, sa edukasyon at sa iba pang mga ano no, sa iba pang mga larangan. Meanwhile, according to Representative Gonzales, the Committee of the Whole Floor Leader, they aim to pass the measure to second reading next Wednesday, March 13. Before the March congressional break, House eyes to approve it. Uh, we will perhaps uh, have a short break to distribute the same, and when once we resume, then we will uh, we will uh, uh, attempt to to uh, to approve the committee report so that it will be reported out for a second reading uh, next week. In the Senate, the same measure or resolution of both houses number six is also under deliberation. 
However, according to the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Codes, they plan to discuss it in the plenary before the State of the Nation Address or SONA of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Senate President Juan Miguel Mixibiri dismisses his alleged ouster as he extends gratitude to his colleagues for expressing confidence in his leadership. According to Zubiri, the statement of support has garnered more signatures from majority senators. He also clarified that the manifesto did not come from him but was initiated by his colleagues. However, he admits that securing enough votes to pass economic charter change is a big challenge to his leadership. This as some of his colleagues are already opposing the resolution of both houses number no. 6, which he said he already raised to President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., while others are concerned on the lack of clear Senate rules in processing the resolution. Zubiri remains hopeful that they can secure the, the needed 18 votes to pass the economic charter change in the Senate and that they can still convince those who are opposing the measure. Maraming haka-haka, chismis na uh, papalitan daw ako, ikukuditaw daw ako para mata matigil na yung haka-haka at uh, usapin na yan, yung mga rumors na yan, ay ginawa na po nitong manifesto of support. Senator Aimee Marcos will also object a contempt order issued by a Senate panel versus Kingdom of Jesus Christ leader Apollo Kibuloy. According to the lawmaker, she and Senator Robin Padilla have agreed to sign against the contempt order. The presidential sister believes the allegations against the religious leader are now pending in court and that Kibuloy should not be oppressed. The senator hopes they will be able to muster enough votes to reverse the order. Eight votes are needed to overturn the contempt order, which will in effect block the Senate's arrest of Kibuloy. Parang hindi naman siya tama at uh, sa palagay ko, sasamahan kami ng iba pa naming uh, grupo, Senator Go, Senator Sincha, ako. Pero hindi pa yata kami umaabot ng uh, kinakailangan na 8 votes or 7 votes para ma-withdraw yung contempt order. Pero mula sa pool talagang tutol ako sa pag issue ng Sabina. Yung ibang akusasyon ay napakatagal na, ba't ngayon lang lumilitaw ng sabay-sabay? Baka naman may nasa likod ng lahat na ito. Kaya gusto natin bigyan siya ng pagkakataon higit sa lahat. Ang uh, pagkaintindi ko, ko, meron na rin mga kaso na pinila sa korte. Kaya uh, siguro huminahon tayo at wag naman natin na uh, inaapi yung tao. After conducting voter registration and voter education in different government agencies such as Congress, GSIS, and even in private schools and organizations, the Commission on Elections or Comelec will also bring the voter registration in communities of those belonging to Indigenous people or IP. This is to show that they have equal rights to vote, which they can exercise. Just sa may bandang area ng Sambayas, sa Palawan, sa Mindoro, ang Lowe, hindi naman ngayon. And just sa Mindoro, syempre, halos lahat naman ang nato sa Mindoro ay member ng indigenous people. Magbula sa Lumad, magbula sa sa uh, mga Maranao, sa maging Dalawan, kahit uh, sa bandang area ng uh, Pasulta, mga yan mga yan ay IP. So, iba pa rin history natin lahat ng yan upang maramdaman ang nila, sila ay Pilipino. The poll body is optimistic that before the voter registration on September 30, they can achieve the target of 3 million new registered voters. As of March 4, a total of 910,918 applications have been received by the Commission across the country. And for the news abroad. The United States Supreme Court has temporarily blocked the enforcement of a controversial Texas immigration law, Senate Bill No. 4, which would have granted state officers the authority to arrest individuals suspected of entering the country without proper documentation. Osalito Likido tells us why, live. Yes, Osalito, good evening. Good evening, LC. The United States Supreme Court has issued a temporary block on a Texas law known as Senate Bill 4, 
which would empower state officers to arrest individuals suspected of entering the country without documentation. Initially scheduled to take effect on Saturday, the law's enforcement has been postponed until at least March 13, pending further examination by the court. This decision follows a request from the Department of Justice for Supreme Court intervention, citing concerns over the potential impact of the Senate Bill 4 on federal immigration enforcement and U.S. relations with Mexico. Opponents of the bill, including the American Civil Liberties Union, have criticized the law as an infringement on federal immigration authority and a potential violation of the U.S. Constitution. They argue that the measures exceeds the state's jurisdiction and could lead to unjust prosecution and expulsion of migrants and refugees. Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed the Senate bill into law in December as a part of a broader effort to address illegal border crossings. However, critics contend that the law contradicts federal statutes and could disrupt U.S. foreign relations. The Supreme Court has given Texas until March 11 to respond to the federal government's arguments. This legal battle over Senate Bill 4 reflects ongoing disputes between Texas officials and the Biden administration regarding immigration enforcement along the Texas-Mexico border. Several Republican governors have voiced support for Abbott's initiatives, alleging inadequate federal action to enforcing existing immigration laws. Back to you, Elsie. Thank you, Joselito Likido reporting live from Malaysia. United States President Joe Biden has announced that he would put a limit to what banks can charge for late credit card payments. Mavian Dog will tell us why. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB, has issued a new rule on Tuesday, March 5, capping credit card late fees at US$8 as part of the latest crackdown by President Joe Biden's administration on high consumer costs. CFPB Director Rohit Chopra said the move, which will cut the average fees by over 20 US dollars, is expected to save American families 10 billion US dollars annually. According to Chopra, credit card issuers have been exploiting a loophole over the last 10 years, which allowed them to increase their fees each year with automatic inflation adjustments. The Biden administration will also be investigating how the private equity industry may be increasing health care costs for Americans and threatening patients' health, the safety of the workers, and the quality of care while generating profits for firms. The probes came as American voters expressed their concern over increasing costs of consumer items and economic policies under the current administration of President Joe Biden, who is seeking re-election in November. Mavian Dog, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. We'll share more global stories with you later. But for now, back to you, Harleen. Thank you, Elsie. For those watching or live streaming on YouTube, please click the subscribe button you see on your screen and ring the bell for notification. You may also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. The National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, or NTRMC, has reported that the agricultural sector has borne the brunt of the El Nino phenomenon, with damages exceeding a staggering 1 billion pesos nationwide. But despite the vast damage caused by El Nino, the El Nino Task Force ensured that no shortage with water and energy will occur in the country. Jed Neresina details why. Assistant Secretary Joey Villarama, spokesperson of Task Force El Nino, said that the heat caused by El Nino may last until the month of May. At the same time, there is a growing concern regarding the potential issues with water and energy supply if public consumption continues to escalate. Uh, nagbigay ng analogy yung uh, isang uh, uh, kasamahan natin sa pag-asa. So, ang na-experience natin ngayon is strong and mature El Nino. So, ito yung pinaka uh, matindi na level. So, wala siyang quantitative uh, measure eh, kung, uh, in terms of temperature kasi diba range yung binibigay nila. Pero, uh, ang sinasabi nila is, um, yun nga, uh, may mananalasa sa mga pananim, iinit yung temperatura, um, bababa yung water levels uh, sa mga dam obviously dahil mag -e evaporate Now that we are experiencing the effects of the El Nino phenomenon, Villaram assured the public that there's no shortage in the supply. 
wala pa rin nakikitang um, problema ang Department of Agriculture. As of uh, February 13 na nag-report si Secretary Lauren mismo kay uh, Pangulong Marcos sa isang um, sectoral meeting. This time is what they call dry harvest season, in which previously planted grains are being harvested, so rice is still expected. DA also ensured that there is an adequate supply of basic products such as chicken, pork, corn, and sugar. Currently, they said there is an oversupply of eggs in the country. As for water supply, ASEC Villarama said there is enough storage in the dams and there is no need to reduce the allocation to customers. Jed Neresina, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. A higher ranking official from a public school in Kalaokan City has been issued a 90 day preventive suspension by the Department of Education or DepEd. This action comes in response to allegations that the official required students to pay 60 pesos for worksheets and booklets needed in their learning recovery classes. DepEd spokesperson and Nurse Secretary Michael Bower revealed that the decision to impose preventive suspension stemmed from numerous complaints launched by parents of students from the said school regarding the costs associated with catch-up Fridays. Despite the gravity of the situation, BOA has refrained from disclosing the name of the school and the specific school official subjected to preventive suspension. Furthermore, he reiterated Deped's stance that there was no directive allowing students to incur expenses for catch-up Fridays or any school activities. Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA has confirmed that enforcers from local government units in Metro Manila will continue to issue violation tickets to motorists found in breach of traffic laws. This decision comes in light of ongoing legal proceedings as the Supreme Court's ruling on the matter has not reached a final and executory status. JP Nunez details why. Following the Supreme Court's ruling, which was released last Monday, the legal team of Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA has determined that the decision concerning traffic enforcement in the National Capital Region is not yet final and executory. The ruling stated that enforcers from local government units or LGUs lack the authority to issue violation tickets to motorists and the LGUs should adopt the single ticketing system crafted by the MMDA. MMDA clarified that enforcers from LGUs will still continue to issue violation ticket and they have 15 days to submit motion for reconsideration. Sa ating po mga kababayan, na motorista, kung kayo po ay huhulihin ng mga local traffic enforcers, bag po tayo makipagtalo at i-argue na sabi ng Korte Suprema ay bawal na kayo manghuli at mag-issue ng ticket dahil hindi pa nga po ito final and executory. So, sa ngayon, pwede pa po manghuli ang mga local traffic enforcers. According to MMDA, their force is insufficient to cover the whole Metro Manila in apprehending airing motorists. They have only around 800 personnel who are trained to issue violation ticket. It is far less than the 8,000 personnel needed if they will deploy at least 500 enforcers in every LGU in Metro Manila. Yung pong mga karsada na sa jurisdiction namin, including mabuhay lanes, hindi po namin kayang bantayan dahil napakahaba po niyan. So kailangan po talaga namin ang tulong ng mga local traffic enforcers. And besides, mas alam po nila yan eh, yung mga especially mga inner roads. It will also be challenging for the MMDA to deputize traffic personnel as it will undergo trainings, seminars, and exam. Kasi syempre kung magde-deputize kami, i-delegate namin yung authority eh sa mga local traffic enforcers. So we want to make sure din naman na qualified sila, may proper training probably, and alam nila yung kailangan nilang ipatupad na batas para maiwasan po yung pagtatalo, pagkakamali, and yung pag-aabuso.
Looking ahead, the MMDA will address these concerns in the upcoming Metro Manila Council meeting scheduled for next Tuesday. Among the agenda items will be the potential submission of a motion for reconsideration regarding the Supreme Court's decision. JP Nunez, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. And in other global news, warrants have been issued by the International Criminal Court or ICC for the arrest of top Russian commanders Sergei Kobilash and Viktor Sokolov. The ICC believes there were reasonable grounds that the pair had responsibility for missile strikes on Ukrainian electric infrastructure during the first few months of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ryuji Sasaki will tell us why. Top Russian commanders Sergei Kobilash and Viktor Sokolov were expected of committing war crimes in Ukraine with missile strikes against Ukraine electric infrastructure carried out under their command from October 10, 2022 to March 9, 2023. The 58-year-old Kobilash was the commander of the co-called Russian Air Force long-range aviation when Russian strikes on densely populated areas of Mariupol were conducted. On the other hand, Sokolov, who is 61 years old, was the commander of the Black Sea Fleet during the period. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky welcomed the arrest warrants, stating that every perpetrator of war crimes against Ukrainian civilians and infrastructure will be held accountable. Meanwhile, Moscow denies such war crimes in Ukraine. It also emphasizes that ICC's arrest warrants have minimal effect, as Moscow, as well as other major powers, such as the United States and China, are not members of the court. Prior to these arrest warrants, the ICC issued the first warrants in March last year, targeted at President Vladimir Putin and Children's Commissioner Maria Lova Belova for charges related to the abduction of Ukrainian children. ICC Prosecutor Karim Khan says he will continue to seek cooperation from Russia, which has so far declined engaging with the ICC. The Geneva Conventions and other protocols shaped by international courts state that there should be a distinction between civilian objects and military objectives, and attacks on civilians are forbidden. However, ICC prosecutors want the charges against the strikes labeled not only as war crimes, but also crimes against humanity, being part of a state policy of widespread attacks on the civilian population. Ryuji Sasaki, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. United Nations Food Agency, the World Food Program or WFP, has dispatched 14 trucks to resume deliveries of food aid to northern Gaza on Tuesday, March 5. However, the convoy was blocked and turned back by the Israeli Defense Force or IDF after waiting for three hours at the Wadi Gaza checkpoint. WFP described their attempts as largely unsuccessful. Since February 20, the Emergency Relief Agency paused its delivery of aid to northern Gaza on February 20 due to security conditions and incidents of violent looting. After being rerouted, WFP's convoy was stopped by a desperate crowd of people and looted around 200 tons worth of food. WFP's Deputy Executive Director Carl Skow said that the agency will continue to explore every possible means to deliver food to the starving people of Gaza, who are one step away from famine. The European Commission has presented the first ever European Defense Industrial Strategy at EU level. The said executive body unveiled plans to spend 1.5 billion euros to boost the continent's defense industry capabilities and develop new technologies. Mavian Dog tells us why. On Tuesday, March 5 in Brussels, top European officials proposed a 1.5 billion euro arms package to support its member states and improve defense readiness. This move marks a departure from relying on the protective cover of the United States through the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or NATO alliance. The European Union or EU aims to strengthen its defense sector in the face of Russia's ongoing war of aggression against Ukraine, which marked the return of high-intensity conflict in the continent. Vice President of the European Commission, Margaret Vestager, 
outlined in a statement the challenges currently faced by the bloc such as overcoming manufacturing weaknesses and becoming more self-reliant, especially in crisis periods and new security contexts. Between the start of the war in 2022 and mid-2023, EU countries have spent more than 100 billion euros on military gear. 80% of defense spending has gone to companies outside Europe, with more than half going to the United States alone. The Commission now plans to procure at least 40% of defense equipment by 2030 in a collaborative manner with its 27 national governments. In addition, the Commission also put forward a pilot program to model the U.S. foreign military sales scheme, under which the United States helps other governments to buy from local arms technology firms. However, all the proposals will need approval from EU's member countries as well as the European Parliament. While NATO will also closely study the proposals to ensure these do not duplicate or clash with the transatlantic alliance's work. Mavian Dog, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And those are the reasons behind the news in other parts of the globe. I am Elsie Marcos, live from Auckland, New Zealand. Good evening. Today, March 6, marks a significant milestone in the healthcare landscape of the Philippines as the first ever Bagong Urgent Care and Ambulatory Service or Buka Center opens its doors at the Jose B. Lingad Memorial General Hospital in Santo Tomas, Pampanga. Spanning 5,000 square meters, this one-story facility is poised to revolutionize healthcare delivery by offering a wide range of surgical services, including general surgery, oral maxillofacial surgery, otorhinolaryngologic surgery, and reproductive health services. In addition to these essential surgical services, the Buka Center will also provide additional services such as ambulatory surgery and ophthalmology, orthopedics, pediatrics and dentistry, as well as radiology and pharmacy services. This pioneering ambulatory medical and surgical care facility in Pampanga is established with the aim of meeting the healthcare needs of Filipinos, particularly the underserved individuals from central Luzon, including Pampanga and its surrounding municipalities. Health Secretary Herbosa shared that they have ambitious plans to establish 28 primary care centers nationwide to cater to the healthcare needs of of 28 million Filipinos by the year 2028. The semi-finals of the UN TV Cup Season 10 have officially commenced. With four teams vying for two coveted slots in the finals, the competition is fiercer than ever. As this tournament progresses, it's worth noting that four teams have bid farewell to the league. Their departure marks the end of their journey in this season's competition. JP Nunez reports. Rivera is straight. The best of three series format for the semifinals of the UNTV Cup Season 10 has kicked off with two exciting matchups. We have the Department of Agriculture Food Masters facing off against the defending champions, the AFP Cavaliers, while the SSS Cabalicat and the Ombudsman Graf Busters engage in an intense battle on the court. The stakes are high as the first team to secure two victories will advance to the finals, where a cash prize of 3 million pesos awaits for their chosen beneficiary. This marks a significant movement for the SSS, Ombudsman, and Department of Agriculture teams as they make their debut in the semi-finals since joining the League of Public Servants. Meanwhile, the AFP Cavaliers, aiming for their fourth consecutive championship, are determined to make history with a back-to-back -back win, a feat yet to be achieved in the UNTV Cup. Sa fans ng AFP Cavaliers, especially sa... I mean, Chief of Staff, si Sir Browner, sir. Wow, wag kayo masawan sumuporta sa amin. Eh, 
hopefully na makuha uli po natin na makatulong po tayo sa ating beneficiary. Meanwhile, bidding farewell to the league are four teams who didn't clinch a spot in the semifinals. Despite falling short of their target, Season 8 champions DENR Warriors, assistant coach Norlito Eneran, remains proud of their team's performance alongside the coaching staff. In a thrilling knockout game in the quarterfinals, the Ombudsman Graf Busters narrowly defeated the DENR Warriors by a single point. Hands off to them. Uh, ginawa nila talaga lahat ng kaya nila at uh, makakaya for this game. So thank you, thank you so much sa mga players, uh, coaching staff, sa lahat ng sumusuporta sa amin. Yung DNR management, talagang thank you so much at uh, pasensya na kayo. At uh, kung hindi man namin na-meet yung expectations uh, ng uh, DNR community, uh, thank you, thank you so much pa rin sa pagsuporta sa amin. This is a journey. At lahat naman ng paglalakbay may mga ups and downs. So isa ito sa mga down namin. Isa ito sa mga nandito kami sa baba and uh, naka-experience din naman kami nung nasa taas. So we be accepted the fact that uh, breaks of the game and uh, basta lahat ginawa namin, uh, wala kaming dapat ikahiya. Nonetheless, the DNR Warriors will be receiving a tax-free cash price of 200,000 pesos which they will allocate to their beneficiary the Environmental Sports Association, Incorporated. Looking forward, the Senate defenders pledge to bounce back stronger in the next season. Late na kasi nung ma-realize ng, mga, ng team na kaya na makapag-compete. It was a little too late for us, di ba? Kita niyo naman, we had a good game against Ombudsman, DNR. Pero the, 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 the tournament for us this season is up and down eh. Mas marami yung down kaya sa app. So sana ma-address ma namin yan next season. Maraming maraming sana po sa supporters ng Senate Defenders, ang supporters po. So pasensya po, hindi tayo naka-advance naka sa semis. Pero we'll do better po next season. Uh, Diyan lang po kayo, supporta lang po. And uh, napakagandang tournament po nitong UNTV. Uh, Naglaro ka na, nakakatulong ka pa. They intend to allocate their cash prize of 200,000 pesos to Gan Servants PH, Senate Spouses Foundation Incorporated, and Kaith Foundation Incorporated. As for the NHA Home Masters, they are contemplating on how to strengthen their force for their return in the next season. One is yung defense namin, especially yung rebounding namin, yung box out. Two is yung offense namin, kailangan maging fluid at saka maging consistent yung mga shooters ko. Thank you kay GM Ty, kay Boss Charles, kay Boss Serge, sa mga nagsusupport sa amin, yung mga managers ng NHA, yung mga fans namin, yung mga empleyado, yung family namin, saka yung mga players. Uh, thank you sa support. Uh, we will be back by next year. Uh, gagalingan pa namin para makuha na natin yung championship. They plan to contribute their 200,000 pesos cash prize to the NHA Provident Fund. Although they didn't make it to the semifinals, GSIS still considers their performance this season as their best. Expect a better and uh, more aggressive and more willingness to win uh, yung, uh, GSIS uh, Furies for next year. We're going to be preparing as early as a few months before the, the tournament where we can give a better showing and move on from the quarters and maybe into the semis and give ourselves a chance to win a championship. Thank you for uh, always supporting yung, uh, GSIS Furies. We'll be coming back stronger next year and we hope to see you in our games, uh, especially next year when we get a better run going into a championship uh, for the GSIS Furies. Concluding their campaign with a significant win in the quarterfinals, the GSIS Furies selected beneficiary, the GSIS Employees Association, will receive their 200,000 pesos cash prize. JP Nunez, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. And before we close, we will leave you with a word, giving glory to God. From the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 7, it says, But refuse profane in all wives' fables, 
and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And those are the reasons behind the news March 6, 2024. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. Because we need to know. We will always ask why. I'm Hardin Delgado. We serve the people. We give glory to God.